Have all members voted. Tonight, will school vouchers make the final spending plan? Texas lawmakers in the House debate over how to spend a multi-billion dollar budget. Plus, how much is being allotted to pregnancy crisis centers under Texas's abortion ban? And later, the cost of expanding natural gas. They're not doing the basics, weatherization. Why some energy experts say two bills passed by the Texas Senate may raise energy bills. Capital Tonight starts right now. Thanks for joining us here on Capital Tonight. I'm Karina Kling. The Texas House is taking a stand against private school vouchers, signaling a tough road ahead for one of Governor Greg Abbott's priorities. Here is a live look of the House floor right now, where lawmakers are hammering out the details of a more than $300 billion two-year budget plan. The budget is the only bill lawmakers must pass each session. The proposal includes $17 billion for property tax cuts and more money for mental health services, to name a few. But education funding is taking center stage. During this debate, House members approved a budget amendment opposing school vouchers. The vote comes the same day the Texas Senate took up its bill that would create a voucher-like program. They are still debating it now, but it is likely to pass in that chamber. Let's bring in our Charlotte Scott now. She's been covering the budget debate over in the House and joins us now from the Capitol. Charlotte, what happened with this anti-voucher amendment there in the House? Well, even if vouchers have grown in popularity over the past two years, the House chamber sent a strong message that it's going to face challenges. But there was a fight and House leadership did try to push the vote to a later day. Support education freedom. Pressuring us to oppose school choice. I Vouchers were dead on arrival in the Texas House Irving. on Thursday, Next despite a plea from the public votes, education chair to uh, table an amendment and speak against this amendment. A coalition of Republicans joined Democrats to vote against using state funds in school voucher programs. A record vote has been granted. The clerk will ring the bell. The amendment's so author, Democrat now, Representative uh, Abel Herrero, said this was a vote for public school from, teachers from, from, from and students. These are public funds for public schools. That's something Austin area representative James Tallarico agrees with. You know, I'm glad to see there is a bipartisan coalition against private school vouchers. I think we all recognize whether you're a Democrat or a Republican that these vouchers are a scam. But not all House members were as excited. Lubbock area representative Carl Tepper said he supports school choice in Texas. Well, it's disappointing. Uh, I think um, the state needs a relief valve. Uh, and I think that choice in schools would be that relief valve. Governor Greg Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick have been promising Texans that a school choice program would pass this legislative session. Patrick leads the Senate, which also had its debate on vouchers Thursday. We're going to rely on our parents to, to monitor and, and be accountable for, is that correct? The bill calls for accountability. With the House and Senate split on the issue, a voucher program faces an uncertain future in Texas. But Representative Tepper isn't sure the conversation is over yet. He says when the conference committee meets to find a balance between the House and Senate budgets, Herrero's amendment could go away. The Senate is still debating its proposal to fund educational savings accounts. It'll likely pass, but it remains to be seen where this measure will go this legislative session. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm Charlotte Scott. Charlotte, thank you. Lawmakers are also looking at pumping in millions to try to make Texas schools safer. Joining us now to discuss this further is Dr. Lawrence Scott. He's an education professor at Texas A&M University, San Antonio, and focuses on school safety. Dr. Scott, welcome to the program. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, lawmakers are looking at things like hardening campuses, having an officer at each campus, among other ideas. I mean, how do you think that would help make Texas schools safer, do you? Absolutely, I do. Uh, as a former administrator, uh, I know the uh, baneful effects of not having uh, that kind of safety net. Uh, and again, I've, I've worked in many schools that had a school resource officer, and they were a part of the community. They were an extension of the community and able to keep students safe. Listen, this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is a, com a, com a community issue, uh, keeping our, our kids safe. Now, I understand that there is a discussion about uh, the funding, right? I know uh, HB3 and HB13 discussed some of the funding of this, but, you know, what price will we put on our students' lives, our kids' lives? And, and one student death is too many. So I think that having a resource officer at every campus 
is something that we definitely need to invest in if we want to see the progression of our community. What else do you think needs to be done that potentially isn't being discussed right now? Well, as a former school counselor, prevention. You look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, that social emotional uh, part of prevention is super important. So I think that if we can reinvest more monies into school counseling programs and uh, uh, you know SEL programs, uh, social emotional learning, to get counselors, you know, they're not doing system support, but they're re uh, reorganizing their time to do responsive services, and and they're not purveyors and arbiters of testing, but they're also helping students uh, during their uh, social emotional needs. Uh, one of the other things is Davis Law. You have Davis Law in place. And Davis Law has been, uh, uh, you know, amazing. You know, before it was, as an administrator, it was 300 feet. Didn't think happened within 300 feet. That's something we needed to mitigate. Well, Davis Law would uh, allow even cyberspace. If you see something, say something. So if we can continue to have our administrators develop communicative values with the parents in the community, people that can see something yeah. can say something. And we always have that. Dr. Scott, requiring districts, districts to adopt active shooter plans is also being discussed. I mean, do you think that that is necessary training for schools, just a, a world that we live in now? Unfortunately, we are there. We're there where, uh, we, you know, first responders are responding to schools and churches and, and you know, uh, libraries and movie theaters. Uh, but I think going back, uh, you know, there's things, you know, uh, having training and continuing assimilations clear backpacks, having doors locked from within, uh, community-based hall monitors, uh, cameras accessible to not just school personnel, but also uh, first responders when need be, uh, panic buttons and radios in every classroom. These are just common sense things that I've seen on the ground working 17 years as an administrator and as a school counselor that have worked and prevented many, many, many of the imminent dangers that could have affected our, our schools and communities. There are some on, on the other side who are concerned about some of these measures, saying that we're just going to make schools look more like prisons. Um, and, and, I mean, is there a good balance, and do you agree with that? That is true. Uh, I spent my final years at, at, a, um, at an alternative school, and I understand the, the optics of the, uh, the, the, the discussion about making it look like prisons and fortifications. But I do think it's important that we have to work with the school and the school has to work with the community to come up with a, a, a concerted plan to make sure our, our students are safe. So yes, on the front end, the optics look, looks really bad, but again, what price yeah. do we put on a child's life? Yeah, and as we mentioned, millions being pumped in, pumped in. We'll see uh, how much they spend on all of the school safety in the end. Dr. Lawrence Scott, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Take Pleasure. care. Pleasure. Let's get a check now of some of the other political stories making headlines across Texas. As part of the budget debate today, House members approved tens of millions of dollars for crisis pregnancy centers. These centers have seen much higher demand since the state's abortion ban went into effect. Most Democrats objected, saying the centers don't offer actual health care and lack regulations. One lawmaker is pushing for military veterans to help fill the teacher shortage. A proposal by a Republican House lawmaker would let veterans skip the normal certification and degree requirements to become a teacher. Anyone with an honorable discharge would be allowed to teach with a temporary teaching certificate for up to five years. The proposal passed out of committee but has not been scheduled for a full House vote yet. And a House committee approved a bill to repeal the state's now defunct law banning gay sex. The panel passed it with a unanimous vote after the bill's author edited edited it to keep current language saying homosexuality is, quote, not a lifestyle acceptable to the general public. It had some opposition during committee debate. Governor Abbott announced a new plan today to fight fentanyl in Texas. He hosted a summit for his campaign One Pill Kills, where he revealed a new program to distribute the overdose-stopping drug naloxone to every county. He addressed the families of those who died from fentanyl poisonings, saying lawmakers would keep this fight a priority. I want all of you all to know that we're going to work every day at the Capitol to address what caused your suffering. Governor Abbott included fighting the opioid crisis in his list of emergency items during his State of the State Address. Turning now to the Texas border, the end of Title 42 is set for next month. With that on the horizon, the White House is proposing a more restrictive asylum rule. Adolfo Muniz explains why some doctors working with migrants are now speaking out on border policy. It's a hard but very fulfilling work as a medical professional for Karina with Doctors Without Borders. 
but it's a whole different thing as a human being. The reality at this border of Reynosa, Mexico, can be challenging. It's something Porque muchas veces llegan con nosotros personas que han sufrido secuestros, violencia sexual. Eh, o sea, sí está para nosotros algo complicado porque muchas veces las personas se descargan con nosotros. And overseeing it all is Laura Gomez. She is from Colombia. She has been from the start and in different countries where the crisis unfolds. For her, it doesn't get any easier either. I've been also working in, in Panama when we just opened the project with the MSF, and I think one of the things that have shocked me more is the fact that uh, these people are taking such a huge risk for them and their families, and then they are stopped here in Mexico. Doctors Without Borders has doctors from around the world, and now this humanitarian organization is warning that a proposed new asylum rule for the end of Title 42 could deepen the crisis even further. It is a measure designated to curve the access to asylum. So it means that we will probably see an increase of population trap at the, at the southern border of the United States. The administration is calling it presumed ineligibility, which means that whole groups of people would be disqualified for U.S. asylum even before they make it to the border. That's why Doctors Without Borders was one of the organizations recently to participate in the public comment section where they had a petition to the federal government. MSF is urging Biden's administration to withdraw their proposed rule and ensure and restoring full access to asylum. But as for Karina, even if the large influx the administration fears comes, no matter how hard, she is ready. Yo estoy orgullosa de pertenecer a Médicos Sin Fronteras. Es para ayudar a las personas de, de las personas que más que lo necesitan. That was Adolfo Muñiz reporting. Still to come on Capitol tonight, the push to add more natural gas power to the Texas grid, why some energy experts are pushing back. And later, how state lawmakers are trying to help Texas universities catch up to the Longhorns and the Aggies financially. Welcome back. State lawmakers are taking steps to add more natural gas power to Texas. The Senate approved two major bills they say are meant to prevent another catastrophic power shortage like what happened during the deadly 2021 winter storm. One measure would funnel money to hire entities to build plants that would come online in an emergency. The other would create a financial incentive to encourage the private development of certain energy generation source resources. Critics say the bills could be costly for customers and ignore efforts to reduce electricity demand. With us now to discuss these bills further is Doug Lewin. He's an energy expert and the president of Stoic Energy. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in. I know that you've been criti critical of these measures. I mean, why, why do you think that they are not really the right step in the right direction? Well, I think a lot of what you're seeing that what just this package of bills just came out of the Senate. I, the analogy I would use is like they're running a triple reverse flea flicker when they haven't learned to block and tackle, right? Like they're not doing the basics weatherization, right? We still have not weatherized our gas supply. We have not sufficiently weatherized our power plants. We have lots of data from just this past December that shows that job is not done. They haven't moved on weatherizing homes and buildings, making sure we're lowering demand. And they're trying to make all these very difficult convoluted changes to the market when they haven't taken care of the fundamentals, the basics. What about just the, the reliance then on, on natural gas and pushing that? Because I know that there are also concerns just about um, making more energy efficient homes and push a bigger push towards that. Yeah, the natural gas supply system still is not weatherized. There's a lot, of more, there's a lot more work to be done there. And I think we also have to recognize that natural gas prices are very volatile, right? We saw this in 2022 with the Russian invasion and the spike of natural gas. And we saw, we now have quantified that renewable energy saved 
11 billion dollars in the market and if you're moving more and more towards natural gas without taking into account the consumer impact there which i don't think the senate is nearly sufficiently done i think you're really it's it's a real it could be a real problem for the for the economy it could threaten the whole texas economic miracle what do you think would be more effective in terms of costs in terms of reliability and just making sure that the grid is reliable yeah i think there, there needs to be much more of an emphasis on the demand side that is definitely an area of weakness for the state I think we could do a lot more with energy storage, I think is absolutely an area we could look at. There are also emerging technologies like geothermal, advanced nuclear, and even with natural gas, there are ways to bring more natural gas into the market without creating this, they call it $10 billion. I think that's a pipe dream. I think it's much more likely to cost $15 billion or more. Um, obviously, this was the Senate's approach as a priority of the lieutenant governor. I mean, the House has to sign off on this as well. And how do you see this kind of coming, shaking out in the end? Well, I certainly hope that the House will be much more deliberative and, and thoughtful about this. Uh, you know, we heard the independent market monitor, one of the very few independent voices testifying on these bills, say she could not wrap her head around the details of one of the particular bills, Senate Bill 7. She spends most of her waking hours studying the market. If she doesn't understand it, what's the chance that the legislature does? I think it's also notable that Americans for Tax Reform, Grover Norquist Group, one of the leading right of center conservative groups came out against these bills because they basically said they amount to a tax on energy consumers. So I hope that the House will be much more deliberative and consider the consumer impact and hopefully head a different direction. We just have about 30 seconds left, but kind of stemming off of all of that, um, lawmakers say, said that this approach, the funding, funneling more money to natural gas um, will improve the grid because it's just something that can happen with the flip of a switch. I mean, what's your response to that? A, we have seen that there are times when gas is not dispatchable, particularly during extremes, right? We saw that in May last year when it yeah. got really hot and we lost some gas plants, during December when it got really cold uh, and, and we lost some gas plants. And B, there's lots of other forms of dispatchable. We have a lot of storage in the queue that can solve a lot of these problems. Doug Lewin, we'll have to leave it there. We will get you back as we continue this conversation throughout this legislative session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Texas House and Senate panels approved similar bills to boost funds for certain Texas universities. The proposals would create the Texas University Fund and provide billions for schools not benefiting from the permanent university fund that only helps schools within the University of Texas and Texas A&M systems. The main difference between the House and Senate versions is how much funding would be allocated. The group of senators approved $2.5 billion, while the House panel gave it $3.5 billion. The funds would go towards supporting research in higher education. Education. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas accepted several luxury trips from a Texas billionaire and Republican mega donor that were not disclosed. That's according to a report from ProPublica. The report says Justice Thomas and his wife Jenny, a conservative activist, went on lavish trips to Indonesia, New Zealand, Texas, California, and Georgia. Some of those trips reportedly included travel on Harlan Crow's super yacht or private jet. The report found only one of those trips was disclosed on Thomas's public financial filing with the Supreme Court. In a statement to ProPublica, Crow says Thomas and his wife never asked for the trips. He said he's been friends with them for more than 30 years and the trips are no different from those he has extended to other dear friends. Crow has contributed more than $10 million in publicly disclosed political contributions, according to ProPublica. The candidate field for Houston mayor just got smaller. Chris Hollins is dropping his bid to serve as the city's mayor, opting instead to shoot for the top financial officer as city controller. Those running for mayor include Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and State Senator John Whitmire. In an interview with the Texas Tribune, Hollins acknowledged that Jackson Lee entering the race influenced his decision to drop out. And we will be right back.
Welcome back to Capitol tonight. A new rule proposed by the Biden administration would prevent schools and colleges from enacting outright bans on transgender athletes. But teams could create some limits in certain cases, like to ensure fairness. The plan would apply to schools or colleges that get federal funding. It sets up a clash with Republican-led states like Texas, where lawmakers have enacted sweeping prohibitions on trans athletes. In a new report, the Biden administration is pointing the finger at the Trump administration for the chaotic 2021 Afghanistan withdrawal. Marina Diamante reports on why the White House is largely defending its own handling. An internal review of President Joe Biden's decision to withdraw American troops from Afghanistan in 2021 finds that it was the right call, but that going forward, the U.S. should be more proactive about getting Americans out of countries experiencing instability. The report summarizes the findings of several agencies who looked at the efforts to evacuate Americans, grant visas to key allies, and the deadly terror attack outside the Kabul airport. The report indicated there were no signs that more time or funds would have yielded a, quote, fundamentally different trajectory. And it maintains that the U.S. needed to leave, but largely blames the Trump administration for what went wrong due to lack of communication, planning, and an agreement Trump made with the Taliban that set a deadline for the U.S. to leave. Transitions matter. That's the first lesson learned here. And the incoming administration wasn't afforded much of one. Thus, President Biden's choice was stark, either withdraw all our forces or resume fighting with the Taliban. In response, the Trump campaign rejected the Biden administration's summary. Like other Republicans, Trump's campaign suggested the withdrawal was a sign of weakness to other regimes. One thing that's still not clear is why intelligence officials underestimated how quickly the Afghan government would fall. Officials are defending how the administration responded to that, pointing out the Kabul airport was quickly secured and tens of thousands of civilians safely evacuated by plane. There was a suicide bombing at one of the gates to the airport that killed 13 service members and more than 100 Afghans. According to the report, the gate was kept open to allow American allies to continue their evacuation efforts. The effort was certainly not without days of pain, hardship, or bloodshed, but neither was it without courage or poise or professionalism. The administration says the lessons learned from Afghanistan have been applied in other situations, like in Ukraine, where embassy staff and others were evacuated from the capital during the early days of the Russian invasion. In Washington, Rina Diamante, Capital Tonight. And that is all the time that we have tonight. We're back again tomorrow with the latest in Texas politics. Until then, thanks for watching. Have a great night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. And for more refreshing stories about your community, click the subscribe button right over here. You can also download our Spectrum News app to get live news coverage, weather alerts, and more wherever you are. And don't forget to tune in to Channel 55 on DISH and DirecTV for live local reporting every single day. We'll see you then.